Welcome to the webinar, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Virginia, I'm a trustee at STEPS. I'm gonna introduce um, Nigel Kiley, who's kindly here to talk to us and present the webinar today. Um, uh, Nigel will talk, um, will um, talk about his role and his experience. And within the presentation, he um, will answer many um, frequently asked questions that we have. Um, and then we will also move to the questions that you're going to be hopefully sharing with us uh, in the chat box below. Um, and then we will wrap up and have comments. So um, thank you very much for joining. And at this point, I'm going to go on mute and I will hand over to Nigel. All right, thank you very much, Virginia. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen now. And I'm hoping that you can all see that. Can you just, just can you see that first slide, Virginia? Yeah, lovely. Okay, right, right. Well, well thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so you say I'm Nigel Kelly. I'm a children's orthopedic surgeon in the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Orthopedic Hospital in Oswestry Street, Shropshire, which is one of the only three orthopedic hospitals in the country. Um, also, hopefully, I can bring something a little different to this this webinar tonight because I, I work in the young adult hip service as well. So we do see people with the consequences of Perthes disease in adulthood as well. Um, so I've got a little talk on Perthes disease and um, so I'll be happy to take some, some general questions at the end. So um, so what is it? So um, it was first, it's actually leg carpe Perthes disease. It was described quite early on in 1910. And remember, x-rays has only been around since the late 1800s. So the three people described it at a similar time, but Perthes sort of won the race and that's what we tend to call it now. But the Americans often call it LCP if, if you look at American literature as well. Um, so initially people weren't really sure what it was. They, they thought maybe it was TB affecting the hip. It was a bit of a mystery, but we, we now call it a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. And that means for some reason, the blood supply has been damaged. And when the blood supply is damaged, the bone becomes dead and then it gets replaced by new bone. The body takes away the dead bone, heals the new bone, replaces it and the hip regrows. So that we think is the basis of Perthes disease. One of my colleagues from Birmingham described Perthes as an enigma wrapped in a riddle surrounded by a mystery because it really is a very variable and uh, difficult to predict condition. And we still really, unfortunately, don't know all the answers to why it happens or the best way to treat it. But I'll try and tell you what, what we think we know. Uh, so what happens is, is there's some interruption to the blood supply and into the growing hip. And the growing hip in the child is made of bone and cartilage. And the amount of bone and the amount of cartilage depends on how old they are. Um, and when the, when the bone dies off, the body's reaction is to take away the dead tissue. So new blood vessels grow in, they replace it with soft, spongy bone. And that bone is not very strong. And that bone would then tend to collapse, which is what we see in Perthes disease. And then eventually the, the, the spongy bone is replaced by more dense bone and the bone will reheal over time. So that's what, ha what happens in the uh, sort of a level within the hip joint itself, within the ballpark. We know a few things about Perthes disease. It's typically age four to eight, but it can be younger and it can be older as well. It tends to be boys more than girls, about five to one. It can be bilateral, that's both sides in about 10% about of children. And it, and it presents in a variety of different ways, really. I mean, sometimes it will just present with, with a limp. Now, the parents will report a limp, but sometimes no pain because young children are very good at splinting their own hip stiff, so it doesn't hurt, but they limp. Or they might present with pain. It may be the hip, but it may be the knee or the groin or the thigh. Um, and the duration is variable. It can come on within a few weeks, or parents will sometimes report the child's been um, going on with symptoms for months and months. And very occasionally, we see adults present for the first time with what well, obviously looks like they've had Perthes disease in childhood, but they don't record any problem at all, or maybe someone told it was growing pains and get on with it. And looking back, they had Perthes disease. So it's a very variable presentation. So, what's the, uh, the clinical things to see? Well, we'll see a child walking with a, with a stiff gait limp and when we examine them they may have decreased movement and particularly movement out to the side of the hip which we call abduction and that's quite an important movement for us in terms of predicting what might happen. The quadriceps muscles can be thin because the child's not using the leg so much and the leg can be short because as the uh, hip starts to collapse then there's some shortening of the leg. So th these are the signs that we might pick up when we examine the child. We put Bart there because um, Often these, uh, it's often little boys and often very active little boys as well who get Perthes disease. So even though they've got Perthes disease, it doesn't seem to stop them doing much. And for us as doctors, then when we see it, we've got, we've got to think, is it unilateral one hip or is it bilateral both hips? And it can occur in both hips, but it doesn't occur at the same time. And that's a very important factor. So we've got what looks like Perthes disease in both hips happening at the same time. We think this probably isn't Perthes disease. So that's why we call it asynchronous and synchronous. Is it at the same time? And if it's one side, um, then we have to think, is it definitely Perthes disease? And there are a few other things it can be. So sometimes the children will be diagnosed with an irritable hip or transient synovitis. 
and there may be a history of that before perthase is diagnosed. Uh, and there are other things we'll think about, like inflammatory arthritis or infections, um, or even rarely tumours or other, other causes of the problem with the blood supply. Uh, but birthday itself is re relatively common. Um, but we always beware the normal x-ray uh, because sometimes, um, you know, there may be a normal x-ray, but that, that means birthday is just very early on in its, in its, its, its uh, history. And then if two hips are affected, but they're at different times, and the most likely thing is perthase disease. But if a child's got two hips, they've like got perthase disease at the same time, then there are a range of uh, generalized skeletal disorders. Um, there's very long names there, but the metabolic and genetic conditions that can look like perthase disease, but aren't actually what we call what we're talking about this evening. So who gets it? Who who be the risk factors? So we know we know a bit about some studies um, about which children may be more vulnerable. So we think it's uh, the instance is 2.5 per 100,000 0 to 14 year olds. That's a recent study called the BOSS study, which I'll come on to later. So not, not particularly common. Uh, five to one, we said male to female. There can be a family history as well. There are, uh, there are associations with uh, socioeconomic status and deprivation. Uh, there are associations with passive smoking and also sometimes with behavioral disorders, ADHD, and genital urinary things uh, such as uh, inguinal hernias or uh, um, abnormalities of the testes as well. And there's also some debate about whether the coagulation of blood with the children with perthase are more likely to have uh, um, easily clotting blood, although that's, that's been debated over the years. The susceptible child, there's some factors. They can be low birth weights, generally small for age. Uh, their skeletal age, which is a measurement of the, of the age of the skeleton, if you like, the development skeleton can be reduced in a child with perthase disease. And they may be sort of slightly small in their body proportions as well. So hands and forearms can be relatively small uh, compared to the average child. So there are some generalized features that we might see in a, in a child with perfect. Not always, but you know, these are, these are associations. Um, and there are some theories. This is a um, photomicrograph of the blood supply of, of the hip in a child. Um, and there are some vascular theories. Maybe there's something in the way the blood vessels are formed, that the uh, blood vessels are, are compromised and don't allow the blood to get through to the femoral head, the ballpark. Um, it may be multiple events where the blood supply is blocked off that leads to birth phase disease, but these are all, all at the moment just hypotheses. Uh, and there are, there are some studies looking at the arteries that go into the hip, saying there may be some particularly vulnerable sites for the blood supply. What about around the world? Does it vary around the world? It does, it does seem to be some variation. It seems the further north you are, the more likely you are to get it. Um, and so in Europe, it's always difficult. We've got to think about geography and ethnicity. So they're always geographical and socioeconomic as well as eth ethnicity factors as well. But in South Africa, there's there's certainly some differences in, in the frequency of perthase disease amongst different groups. So it seems to affect, affect white Caucasian children more than it does uh, black African children, for whatever reason we don't know. And some similar studies have borne that out in the United States as well. Uh, in the UK, there are regional variations. So being down south seems to be protective. So if down in, in Wessex, 5.5 per 100,000, but in Merseyside, twice that amount. Is that where you are or is that, are there other factors that we don't know about? And in Norway, we're you know, a relatively prosperous country. It certainly depends where you are in the country about whether you get it. Um, whereas um, uh, in India, it varies whether you're in the southeast or the southwest. So these are, these are difficult to tease out sometimes. There are certainly some geographical variations, but they may be tied in with other factors as well. Um, in, um, so a lot of studies have been done in Liverpool on, on perthase disease. And uh, social class, unfortunately, has a factor as well. So if you're in a high social class, your chance of getting perthase is much lower than the lowest social class. And then again, there may be multiple factors that, that come from that. Um, but time seems to be a great healer. So over the time, um, the instance has decreased. So from 1976 to 1995, we've seen quite a drop. And I think most of us who treat perthase do, do feel we are seeing less of it than we used to years ago. So there's quite a few different things to think about with what might cause um, birthday disease and these different factors we've talked about. Is it diet? Is it multiple episodes of trauma? Is it passive smoking? Is it low birth weight? All, all hypotheses at the moment, we don't know, but these are factors that are, are associated with that. Um, and, and any condition can well have environmental factors. So smoking is, is bad, of course, for everything, isn't it? But it's certainly intra uterine if it's smoking during pregnancy or exposure to smoke and passive smoking are not thought to be good. Could well have an effect on on this as well as other things, and then maybe some nutritional deficiencies as well. So once we diagnose perthase, we know it goes through a process, and um, it's a natural process where bone dies, uh, new blood vessels come in, the dead bones taken away, new bone is laid down, 
and the bones re reheal and remodel. So there's very, very little we can do to influence that biological process. That's just nature doing its thing. Um, so we describe different stages. Um, so we have an initial stage when the child first presents. When we take the first x-ray, we have what we call sclerosis, that's thickening and dense, increased density of the bone. Then it starts to collapse and fragment. And then it reossifies, that means new bone is formed, and then it remodels. So these are, these are the sort of classic stages of, of herpes phase disease. And we think maybe that this fragmentation stage is, is in fact just cartilage turning into bone. The initial stage um, is about six months. So we notice some subtle changes. You may notice a little bit of widening of the joint, indicating some inflammation in the joint. You may see a little sort of what we call a fractured little area of bone collapse where the bones died and been reabsorbed. Uh, maybe some increased density as the bones sort of squash it down. Then we go to the fragmentation phase, and that, that's about sort of eight months duration. And that's where we say loosenses, that's bits that look clear on an x-ray, which means they've got cartilage in rather than bone. And this is where most of the deformity occurs. So this is where we think the bone is weak. This weak new bone has been laid down and then and it gets squashed with loading. And that's where it kind of fragments and the, and the ball part of the hip flattens. And then there's a reossification stage. So that's when this, this at the end of fragmentation, the bones then start to reheal. New bone is being laid down. The bones turn from soft bone to solid bone. Uh, and this, this starts from the, the inside to the outside. And some of the shape is then regained as well. Then we have the remodeling phase, and this is go. This goes all the way through growth, and so children's hips start growing about 14 for girls, about 16 for boys. So this is when the hip is regrowing uh, and developing its final shape that we will have as an adult. Uh, as a CT scan, they're just showing that this is a hip that's developed sort of a mushroom shape rather than a full shape, nice round shape. So it's just some illustrations again of the different phases. There, as you can see, this is the sclerosis phase where the bone's looking on the right, the right hip, which on on the left side of the screen, but the child's right hip. It's looking sort of denser and whiter than the other side. And then it's starting to collapse. And then it's starting to fragment. And then it's starting to reossify. So it's regrowing. And then it's remodeling. Uh, there are some what we call head at risk signs, which are described. So these are a hip where we think is probably more vulnerable uh, to the effects of perfase disease. And it's described by uh, Catterall many years ago. And um, we can see some um, x-ray features. So on the top left image, there's a, there's a cyst just below the ball part there, which is full of cartilage. And the top right, jump on my mouse, can't I? On the top right, there's um, some, some bone growing outside the edge of the hip joint. Um, and that, that can be a risk factor. And then on the bottom pictures here, there's this sort of appearance here, this indented appearance, which is called gauges sign. Um, again, these are, these are things which we think are a sign of the birth phase disease, maybe going to cause more problems. Uh, when, when, you, when we see a child in clinic, um, we might want to try and classify the perthases and try and have an idea of what it's like and, what, and try and get an idea of what the future might hold. And um, there are a few different classification systems described, but none of them are perfect, unfortunately. One of the ones that's used more commonly you might hear about is the herring lateral pillar classification from 1992. And we base this on an x-ray and we look at, we divide the hip into um, three parts, as you can see on there. And the bits on the outside the, that we measure it and see how high it is compared to the normal side. And we give that a classification of A, B, or C, so A where it's intact, B where it's over 50% of the height, uh, and C where it's less than 50%. And then there's been a, a change of BC grading added onto that as well. The idea of this is a way of just seeing how um, well formed what we call the lateral column is. And this, we think if that's intact, it's going to protect the hip from collapsing uh, because it's been less involved in the part that's taken all the load. So that's a reasonably commonly used classification system. Um, and does it have some value? Um, so if we look at the classification system, if it's uh, or, or herring, herring A, which is a well-preserved one, then the results are all generally good for long term. Um, and if it's B, the majority are good, about two thirds. Whereas as we go down the classification system, we look at C, then, then the results are generally quite poor long term in terms of the outcome of the shape of the hip. And the word stoolberg there, I'll come on to later, it's another, another classification system. So the herring classification does seem to give us some um, idea about what might happen in the future. So that, that can be useful for, for prognosis, for discussing what might happen. Uh, and then if you want to look at long-term outcome, this is another classification system, which is called Stuhlberg, that was named after people who described in the literature. And this is really looking at the shape of the hip when you, when you finish growing, and that gives you a prediction about what life's going to be like in the future. And what we're aiming for really is to have a, a round, very simply is to have a round hip and a round socket, and that gives you your best chance of good outcome for the hip. 
So Stolberg one is, is a normal looking hip and two is a, a reasonably round head that's reasonably matched to the socket. And then if the head becomes ovoid, so it's sort of flattened and um, the socket's not, it's an ovoid shape as well, that's less good. Then if you have a flattened, deformed hip and you have it doesn't match the hip socket, that's generally the worst outcome. That's going to cause long-term problems. So that, that, that's what we're aiming for. So we try and classify early on, and then we try to predict what might happen towards the end of growth. And that's what we're going to try and, try and do is to get the hip to be a Stolberg one or two by the end of growth. So just some terms we use here, spherical congruency, aspherical congruency. Um, so really it's, you know, is it a round ball and a round socket, or is it a square peg and a round hole, which is the worst outcome? And there's some illustrations there, so type three, so that's one where it's, it's you can see it's not round, it's ovoid, and it's, but the socket matches it, whereas type four, it's a very regular shape and it doesn't match the socket, so that's that's going to be a poor outcome. Right, so how, how do you manage birth? So we can diagnose birth disease and we can classify it, but uh, how do you actually manage it? Uh, and that one is really controversial, that one really, I, I've got to say, we, we don't have all the answers to, unfortunately. Um, we've got some treatment aims, so we want to relieve pain because it can be sore, so we want to let the child's pain settle down. We want to keep the hip moving, so range of movement we think is really important. We want to try and minimise the amount of deformity that occurs in the hip, and we're trying to reduce the risk of osteoarthritis, so we want to try and get it into that stool book category one and two around hip and around socket if we can. We've also got to have a, a thing to the future, and if this is a bad hip um, and it's going to end up with arthritis and hip replacement in the future, we don't want to mess up that first hip replacement. We want that to be really, really a good operation that's going to last you as long as you can in adult life. So we've got a principle of containment for um, treating Perthes disease early on. And if we think of it as uh, an ice cream, uh, the ice cream is the ball part of the hip joint. The scoop is the hip socket. If that ball and socket keep moving around each other nicely, we're going to have a nice round ball of ice cream. OK, if it doesn't move and it squashes down, it's going to be flat. So containment is a principle of keeping the, the ball in, in the socket and keeping it mobile. So it remodels over time. Um, so that's what we want to do. So a congruent hip in joint, you want to keep it moving. And over the years, different things have been described to try and contain the hip joint to, to allow that process to happen. And years ago, uh, these devices were used. I mean, so years ago, within, within, certainly within my professional lifetime, we put children into plasters to try and hold the legs apart or splints. Uh, and by and large, we've abandoned these because uh, what happens is the child will just tend to tilt the pelvis to accommodate a stiff hip. My predecessor had a ward full of children who would spend six, 12, 18 months on traction with conditions like Perthes disease in hospital. Uh, and these are things we largely abandoned and now pretty much all gone on the bonfire because we don't think they work or make any difference. And they're quite onerous treatments as well. There's some debate about should you weight bear or not? Should you stop a child weight bearing if they've got Perthes disease? Uh, and um, different devices were tried in the past for that and bed rest. But the problem is you can't stop children weight bearing. Um, little kids want to run around, they want to play, that's what they that's what they do. And um, it's all very well saying don't do things, but we all know that when kids when they're active, you close the door and they'll be jumping up and down on the bed and doing doing what they want to do. So practically stopping someone weight bearing is almost impossible and probably doesn't really have a great effect. So we can go down the line of surgery to try and contain to contain the hip during the early stages of birth phase disease. And there are two broad strategies. We can do an operation on the thigh bone, which is where the disease is. This is called a femoral varus osteotomy. So you've made a cut here and opened it up. And what we're really trying to do, I use my hands again, is just trying to tuck the ball into the socket to contain it, give it its best chance. So this is an operation we do with a scar on the thigh. We put a metal plate in, divide the bone, and uh, tuck the hip into the, into the joint like that. That's called a femoral osteotomy, or femoral varus osteotomy, in its medical terminology. Uh, and then that heals up, and then you see that hip looks like it's nicely tucked underneath the socket. We watch it as it regrows and goes through its birthday disease. And at the end, we've got a nice round hip and a round socket, but we've still got some change in the shape of the upper part of the thigh bone from the surgery. Others, other surgeons may say, well, actually, it's what we should do is really turn the hip socket over the um, ball part to contain it that way. So that's what we call a pelvic osteotomy. Um, and um, this is an illustration here and another illustration here. So this is an operation done on the pelvis. There are different sorts of operations you can do, but essentially you're rotating the pelvis around the, um, um, the hip joint, around the ball part to help contain the hip socket. So two ways really. You can do something on the femoral side, thigh bone on the pelvic side, the socket side. And what to do, again, this is this is really, often we find a very difficult decision. You, we have to think about the child, their age, the stage of the condition, the grade of their condition. Um, and try and make a decision based on that about what we should do. Um, from Herring's 
study, we, there is a limited role for surgery from the evidence provided by herring, but often younger children under the age of six um, with herring A will do very well irrespective of what we do. Uh, the age six to eight is a little bit more controversial about what to do. Um, most will still be non-operative treatments. It's just allowing nature to take its course. Um, we may consider if we have a reduced range of movement, if the hip becomes stiff or we're worried about it not sitting in the joint, we may need to consider something surgical to try and contain the hip joint then. Uh, and in this, this age group 8 to 11, there may be some benefits to surgery in a certain group of children with, in this herring B and C classification. Um, the problem we have is when the herring classification, when we do it, it's at the end of the fragmentation phase. By the time we got to that, you may have missed the boat for doing surgery. So the herring classification in some ways isn't very helpful for us. And then the ones who are um, worse ones in herring C or age 8 to 11, surgery doesn't seem to have any benefits either. And then some children present much older with perphase disease, present over the age of 11, and they behave differently um, to the younger children in perphase disease. Again, more, more difficult knowing what to do with them. It's more like an adult approach would have to a problem with the blood supply to the hip. I mentioned the BOSS study before. So Dan, Professor Dan Perry works in um, Older Hay. He's done a lot of research work on this. And this was a nationwide study in the UK. Two years looking at um, a, a survey really of what people are doing and treating perphase disease. And uh, so though the, the quite large number of cases, the, the overall conclusion was sufficient. In, there was no evidence of improved outcomes from surgery. So even though containment surgery is done quite often, we haven't got any evidence yet of um, improvement with surgery. That maybe we don't have the evidence or there are subgroups that would benefit from it. But certainly there's a role for some studies and a trial in the future to, to look at that. So that's that's what perthase is early on, trying to contain it, trying to maybe change the natural history. What about later on? So some children after a few years, they present with a painful stiff hip. And the um, have a phenomenon called hinge abduction. So this is where the ball parts become flattened. And when the child moves the hip out to the side, what happens? Let me show you. There's a, there's a what we call an article. It's a die test where the um, hip, instead of rolling in the hip joint, it's levering itself out. This is die that's pulling in a gap. It's, it's levering against this point here. It's loading on the edge. So it's painful. And there's limited movement out to the side. So this is a phenomenon we call hinge abduction. And we do have an option for treating that. So we could do a, a, another operation on the thigh bone where we tilt the thigh bone um, out to get that bumper bone out of the way. So the hips have more movement out to the side. And that can be very good for relieving pain. Whether it changes the long-term natural history, we don't know. Probably doesn't. But it's certainly good for the childhood years to getting range of movements and improving pain. And this is a this is a follow-up as well. So we didn't see how the hips remodeled. There are some other operations. So in... Um, Certain centers, uh, people use a hip distractor during perthase disease. So this is a frame on the outside. And the idea is this is the hip is stretched out to try and increase the space in the hip joint. And in theory, this would hopefully allow better blood supply and um, uh, allow some movements and allow the hip to reheal in a better environment without as much load on it. But it's quite a, quite an onerous procedure to do. The child's going to have this on for several months, a lot of physiotherapy, and it's, uh, it is uh, quite hard work. The evidence for it uh, isn't... Um, Great, yeah, and so there are some concerns because of pin sites of an infection around the hip joint as well. And then just, just coming towards the end, so there are some other scenarios we see with perfect disease where the hip's not fully in joint or there's a short leg or there's some deformity in the shape of the hip. Um, and if the hip isn't, isn't well covered and it's causing pain, then we can do operations to uh, add some bone um, to the hip. So there's another operation in the pelvis where we're just trying to put more bone over the top of the hip joint to give it a bit more support. Or we can do something like this, which is called a shelf procedure, where we, put a, we take some bone from the pelvis. And um, you can see on the on the right hip here, we lay a shelf of bone over the capsule, the lining of the joint, to try and provide more support. When you have perthase disease, uh, you can end up with a short leg, and that can vary between one or two centimeters, maybe more, if it's if it's severe. Uh, and there are different strategies to try and manage leg leg discrepancy, and that's something we'll do long term to follow up, see how much shortening there is, and then whether we do something to try and help that, which could be observation, there could be a small shoe raise, and there are surgical options. But what we have to be careful of is if, if we think someone's going to end up having a hip replacement in the future, when you have a hip replacement, they tend to bring the leg down and lengthen it. So we want to, to leave a little bit of shortening in the child is actually not a bad thing, because it means when you have that hip replacement, it will bring the legs out to length. People generally don't like their leg to be over lengthened. So if we've got the leg length balance in childhood, then you have a hip replacement, and the leg was made longer. People tend not to like that. And then some people will end up with um, a hip like this. So this is a hip where 
this part called the neck has really not grown very well, and this part called the trochanter is riding very high, and that can cause pain and impingement. Um, it means the muscles have to work very hard around the hip, and uh, we do some of talk about an operation to try and reconstruct that, um, which I can illustrate on here. Quite a complex operation, not very often done, but it is, is sometimes an option. Uh, I think we did that once or twice really this procedure, but it's an option to try and um, regain some shape of the hip. And then, um, I hope it's not too gory for you, but there are, there are other options now, particularly in younger adults, of so keyhole surgery or open operations on the hip to try and reshape the hip. Um, and that really depends on what the perphase is like and how it's affected. The hip is not suitable for all cases. There has been some discussion in the past about drug treatment. So uh, if anyone's heard of bisphosphonates, so uh, if you've got osteoporosis, people take um, bisphosphonates to try and preserve the bone strength. And there's some discussion about whether that's something that would be suitable to try in the early stage of perphases to try and prevent, prevent the bone collapsing. Uh, the evidence is, is equivocal so far. We don't really know whether that works. And these are drugs given in young children may have longer term effects as well. And finally, um, what you find is that uh, if the hip ends up bad, that you may need a hip replacement. And that's another whole discussion as well. But as I said at the beginning, I work in a young adult hip clinic. And so we see people coming along with perfect disease. And sometimes the only really good answer to a painful stiff hip is a hip replacement. And a hip replacement is a very good operation. It's one of the best operations we have. But we are talking about hip replacement in a younger person. Um, you're never too young for a hip replacement. But if you have a hip replacement, it will wear out in your lifetime. If you're a younger person, then you might need more doing. And so always in the back of my mind when we're treating perfect surgery as a child, we don't want to mess up that first hip replacement. We want everything to be as pristine as possible, the anatomy to be as normal as possible, because that first hip replacement is the one that's going to last you a long time. And a good standard hip replacement should last you 20 years. If it's more complicated or it's lots of scarring and problems from previous surgery, then you may reduce the, the time that that hip replacement will last for before it needs to be replaced. Uh, and then coming, coming back to that classification system we, we talked about before. So what, what's your chance of getting arthritis? Well, if you end up with a, a nice round hip and a round socket, it's pretty low. But the, the more um, the shape of the hip is affected, then the higher your chances of getting arthritis at 40 years. So if you look at the, the worst ones, you've got a 75% chance of getting arthritis at 40 years if you've got a badly shaped hip. So it's, it's, it's almost inevitable, isn't it? So that, that's a, a quick run through perphase, and I think perphase is still a mystery. We don't really don't have all the answers to it. We don't exactly know how to treat it or why it happens. There are surgical options, and they're indicated for some children, uh, but it's always a difficult debate knowing exactly what to do. Uh, it is a lifelong condition, so though the perphase disease is, is in a, something that happens in a short time, the long-term effects will potentially last you through life. And we certainly do need more research in this topic as well to try and work out what the best treatment options are. All right, thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Very good. Thank you very much. And I can see that some questions are coming. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, some, some questions have come in. Um, I'm going to look at the open questions. Tell me if that's wrong, Miranda. So I'm just going to read them out to you if that's all right. So Kate asks, um, for Perthes patients who have hip replacements as teenagers, how do you find their journey through adulthood, specifically replacement around age 14? I know that was towards the end that you were talking about that, weren't you? Yeah. Um, so hip replacement is, is, a, is a very good option. Um, if you've got a painful stiff hip, um, a hip replacement is very good. And we, we have the concept of the forgotten hips. So some people have a hip replacement, they've forgotten they got it. Uh, because their function is that good. So again, that's not everybody, but that's that's often the case. Um, there'll be a period after having a hip replacement of rehabilitation, of, of getting used to the prosthesis, of limited to function. But afterwards, we'd allow people just to get on with their lives, really. There's some, maybe some limitations to extreme sports, but we'd hope that you get on with your life. But if you're 14 and you're having a hip replacement, then there will be further surgeries in the future, of course. Thank you. Um, excellent. Michelle asks, my daughter, who who is now seven, was born with bilateral DDH, then diagnosed with Perthes at three in her right hip. Could there be a link in the two as she wore a Pavlik harness from 16 days old to nine weeks? OK, so there are, there are a few things that overlap there. So if Perthes is, an, is what we call a vascular necrosis, that means damage to the blood supply. One of the complications for treating DDH can be a vascular necrosis. They, they do appear differently. Um, so I can recall, I think, only a handful of patients who've had DDH and then it really did seem to get perphase disease later on. 
but it may just be we've got two two conditions which are just overlapped. So don't if it's not a vast necrosis from as a consequence of the DDH treatment, they may just need a separate condition. So I don't think there's a strong link between the two. But yeah, I have I've seen a few patients where they're both. Um, thank you. Abby asks, my daughter has bilateral oh, it's just disappeared. <laughs> my daughter has bilateral perthes. Her second hip has gone through the fragmentation stage very quickly. Is it likely to break down again due to this? Uh, no, I mean, it, it tends to be a one one way process, so it will go through different phases and then remodel. It doesn't it doesn't tend to regress. Very good. Excellent. Um, Jamie asks, for a child under six who's very active, seems to be unaffected, although the x-rays do show fragmentation, doesn't seem to be in any pain. Would you generally recommend always recommend monitor and physio or would there be exceptions for surgery? Well, again, this is I think it's probably answering individual cases, which are difficult to do. There are um, yeah, there are reasons why you might want to consider surgery. It would be based on the uh, findings, uh, stiffness in the hip, um, and uh, what you might see on the X-ray as well. So there are there are cases, but I think as I said in the talk, it's just very difficult to keep to be precise about it because we just we just don't know. Mm. Uh, another question: Will perthes in children? always lead to hip replacements later in life or can they fully recover and be unaffected into teens and adulthood yeah no so some some will um so we see some children where we, we get a very good recovery and we end up with a nice round hip and a round socket and they do very well so that's great uh we see some children who've got fairly bad looking hips but actually do really well you know and they surprise us i mean we've got kids with bad hips who play football and you know even professional football teams so it's very individual yeah um Abs asks, is there a difference in the disease process of a perthes versus trauma of a pro sorry, is there a difference in the disease process of a per perthes traumatic uh, versus vascular necrosis? Okay, so um if I understand that, so we've got perthes disease, which is um a form of vascular necrosis. Um if you have trauma, so if you break your hip, for example, which is quite a severe accident, the blood supply can be affected. That can cause a vascular necrosis of the hip. Sorry, um, it's me reading the questions wrong. So, perthes versus traumatic. <laughs> but, right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so if you break your hip, um, the blood supply can be interrupted um, and you can get a vascular necrosis. And that can be quite severe. So, it probably acts differently to perthes in, in that scenario. But the, the biological process, if you like, is similar, where bone dies often gets replaced. And it just uh, tends to be the degree that the um, hip is affected. Yeah, okay. Um, the, I think this next question might be a bit too specific, um, but you tell me, cause I'm not a clinician as we keep pointing mm -hmm. out. So my son has perthes in both hips, says Vicky. What are the longer term impacts? How likely is it that he will need hip replacements? So again, it is very individual, doesn't it? It's how old is the child? Um, what treatment they had? Uh, how badly affected are you by the perthes disease? And you, it's just something to, you have to monitor until we get towards the end of growth to know that. Yeah um amelia asks hi my son was diagnosed earlier this year he is 15 and has had a shelf procedure he is finding recovery hard different leg lengths is causing problems and he is constantly tired will it get easier and how early can he have a hip replacement so again i can't comment about what, you know why he might be tired and maybe other reasons for that how early can you have a hip replacement well, the answer is you can have a hip replacement at any age i mean we generally wait until the child's finished growing, so 14 for girls, six, 16 for boys, thereabouts. But if the hip's bad enough and it's, and it's arthritic and causing pain, you, you can have a hip replacement at any age, but it's just you have to balance that up against the long-term implications. Thank you. Um, Ron asks, would a, a seven centimetre leg length difference be considered a large difference? Yes. And is 11 years old too young for a hip replacement? Uh, so seven centimeters is a very large difference if it's in relation to perthes disease. That'd be quite surprising when you have that much difference, uh, unless there's something a bit more complicated to it. Uh, I think 11 is very young for a replacement because the child's still growing. Yes. Um, does perthes, perthes, I keep saying perthes, but it's perthes, sorry everybody. Does perthes also affect bone strength of the pelvis or femur? No, it shouldn't do. No, it is It is just purely the, the ball part of the, of the um the hip joint so on its own it shouldn't affect other things um with a watch and wait approach advised to wait bear as tolerated if pain is manageable would you allow your patients to mobilize without crutches 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't use crutches if having a sort of an acute flare up. Um, you really want to try and maintain range of movements. Um, and um, yeah, no, I normally, we normally encourage weight bearing. It'd be unusual that we'd put children on crutches. Let's say it was a very acute, painful flare up. And we want that for a week or two to settle it down. Very good. Um, is so I think again we might have answered this one, but you tell me is perthase or DDH related in families? Uh, so both of those conditions do have a family relationship. So DDH is a quite strong family history. So if you're um, if you have it as a as a as a parent, you've got about a one in twenty sorry one in ten chance of your child having it. Sorry, one in twenty we've got one twenty chance. Um, perthase is is less so, but there are some families where perthase can run in the family. Uh, but it, but again, it can be environmental factors as well that we mentioned. But it's difficult to tease that out just from sort of genetic aspect to it. But DDH definitely does have a genetic aspect to it. Thank you. My goodness, these questions are coming in thick and fast now. So this, this is great. And thank you, Nigel. You're being brilliant. Um, Tracy asks, my son is now 22 and was diagnosed with perthase at 13. Due to pain, he is preparing for surgery later this month, but the surgeon did not recommend THR. I don't know the medical term for the surgery, but she is essentially planning to shave down the ball so it's more round, then we'll cut bone off the greater trachanta and move it, it yeah. and move it down to restore mechanics of hip using screws. Yeah, yeah. La labrum tearing could be repaired if she sees it needs it. Yeah. Do you have any ex ex experience with this type of surgery and outcome? Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh I hope that's not Tracy, my wife, that's him with TV, but no, no, <laughs> Tracy. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's a whole field of surgery called young, um, hip preservation surgery. Um, and this is where we try and keep the person's own hip joint going. And there are will be some people with perfect disease where there's a reasonable amount of good cartilage. There's a bump of bone which is catching or some deformity, and they can then perform surgery to try and um, restore some of the anatomy and uh, treat anything that's causing pain. Yes, if you've got a hip where all the cartilage is bad, then there's, there's very little you can do about it. But if you've got some good cartilage in the hip, you want to preserve it, and then there are a range of social options you can do for that. Yep. And that's in part of my role in the young adult hip clinic is we do hip preservation type surgery. In perth right. there has to be a very specific set of criteria to, to do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sarah asks, are there other complications that can be caused due to the leg difference post-femoral oste osteotomy? <laughs> osteotomy, yeah. Osteotomy. Osteotomy. Yeah, so oh, there are so different types of osteotomy. The one we did early on is called a varus osteotomy. That will make the leg a little bit shorter. Um, you often find that after an, an osteotomy, the leg will regrow like a bit and grow a little bit longer. So there can be some shortening and some limping because of that. If you, uh, the later stage, you have the valgus osteotomy, that actually makes the hip, the, the leg bone a little bit longer. So often they're a bit short from the perphase disease. The osteotomy gives you about a centimeter or so back in length. Great. Thank you um uh i know this name i think it's nyenke um asks does taking supplements such as vitamin d zinc etc have any effect during the process process of perthes perthase um, would it help with the long-term bone health so we don't know um generally there are recommendations that children under five should have vitamin d anyway in the uk um and uh for babies if they're bottle fed it's okay if they're breastfed then definitely vitamin d there also got a lot of recommendations we should all take vitamin D because we don't have enough sunshine and there's very little in the mm. diet. Whether it would change the outcome of birth disease, I don't know. Um, and I, I don't know about the other, the other supplements like zinc. But we normally recommend you know, a, a, a healthy diet, of course. Um, child getting to a healthy weight because being children, if they're overweight, they're putting more load on their hip joints. That's, that sometimes would be a bad outcome as well. Um, vitamin D is something we don't get much of in the diet, so there's certainly it's a reasonable thing to think about. But whether it changes the outcome of birth disease, I don't think you know. Mm. very good thank you um by the way i'm also seeing that there are lots of people saying thank you very much in the comments but then i think okay. miranda's okay. moving them yeah. on so thank you for your thank yous everybody okay. um are certain sports not smart to do for a child age six age six when she does feel okay i.e she has no pain that's from bart it depends it depends where you are in the process you know early on in birth age disease um you can flare that flare up the pain in the hip if you do too much high impact activity, but but generally you, you need to take guidance from who's treating you. But in certain phases of the disease, when we want to return to activity, whatever the child enjoys, you know, keeping active is good. But yeah, if it's if it's very high impact, then it might just sort of stir things up and cause discomfort. Okay, thank you. Um, oh gosh, Tanya is asking me, so I don't know. <laughs> so does the silent P psoas muscle 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Does the psoas muscle develops differently in Perthes stroke hip patients? And can this cause additional complaints later in life with a THR? Okay, that's very specific. Okay, so um, I'm not aware of the psoas muscle developing differently, um, but if, if you end up with a hip joint that's um, uh, quite sort of prominent at the front of the hip joint, the psoas tend to catch over the front of it, it can cause some irritation and clicking. Maybe that's what she's referring to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think she was asking whether it develops differently, but no, um, because of the oh, yeah, well, no, yeah. no, I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought so. It just maybe it's might cause more symptoms depending on the shape of the hip. Okay. Very good. Um, my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Apologies. Um, have you ever had a child with the age of one and a half years with Perthes? I think we are kind of rare, says Marlu. Yep, uh, I think the youngest are treated is 18 months um, and the oldest can be, you know, sort of 14, 15 sometimes, if you want to call a vascular crisis and age birthday disease. But yeah, 18 months is the youngest, yep. Okay. okay. It's not unheard of, but still no. but unusual. Four, yeah. four to eight is the commonest age, but you do get to yeah. outside that range, yeah. Um, apart from cycling and swimming, which is usually recommended, do you advise or allow any other sports which we can include? Yeah, again, again I think it depends, you know, on that child and the phase of their per phase disease they're in. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I would be happy to encourage children to be active as, as best they can. But yeah, early on, it may just be the older to do it. Um, particularly younger children who've got no sort of uh, restraints or self-control, they'll just go mad and do something and they suffer for it. And then if they inflame the hip, the hip gets stiff and we want to try and avoid the stiffness. Yeah. And a similar one from um, somebody else from Jamie saying, is the issue with sports, for example, football, more about pain management or about the damage it can cause to the hip? So early on in perfect disease, you, you're probably more worried about excessively loading the hip and causing pain and stiffness. Whether it changes long term outcome is debatable. Um, later on in perfect disease, if there's a problem with the shape of the hip joint that's causing impingement or catching in the hip, then if, if they get a lot of pain doing sport, then yes, they may be causing some damage to the, the soft tissue yeah. structures around the hip joint. Okay. Um, so I'm down to the last two questions, but if you do have any more questions, please do send to put them in the in the Q and A. Um, Yvonne asks with with regards to leg 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 length difference mm -hmm. would stunting the growth in their good leg be a normal practice to allow the bad leg to catch up this was suggested to us but we are dubious about cutting his good leg yeah so um if we, if we talk about managing leg length inequality in children's broad principles we can um slow down the growth of the good leg which is a small operation known as an epiphysidesis um the advantage of that is it works gradually it's a small operation um and um you recover from the operation fairly quickly at the disadvantage being you are operating on the good leg, if you like, as mm. well. Yeah, but it's certainly one of the things we choose. Uh, we can, as an option, we can do to uh, surgically treat leg length discrepancy. Very good. And uh, Nicole has another question about soccer, about football. Um, my son was diagnosed with Perthes at the age of eight. He is now almost 14 and playing soccer again for a year now. Is that harmful for the hip? Well, it's. I think if you're at the later stage of birthday disease and it's not hurting you and you enjoy it, then uh, that's okay. That's good. Good. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you, Nicole. That sounds great. Soccer. Um, it feels like they're American if they're saying soccer. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have a large Dutch contention. Oh, okay, maybe. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, another question. So our son had femoral head osteotomy operation in his right side, May 2022 at age six and a half years old, including steel plate installed and the plate removed May 2023. Um, Dr. Now, oh no, PR, now approximately nine millimetres leg length differences. After the operation in 2022, he has had a highly inward rotation of the right leg and a large asymmetry in the hip region. Is the inward rotation an asymmetry related to the operation? And if so, is this normal? Will these two normally righten up during the body growing, i.e. leg facing more forward and hip asymmetry ending symmetric, or will another operation be required for fixing this? I, I think it's a bit too specific a question for me to answer that one. I think is unfortunate without all the details. So sorry. I yeah. That one. Yeah. Sorry. 
yeah I think but thank you for the very full description but I think without yeah. knowing the case you can't you can't answer that uh and then Wim has said thanks for the webinar um um oh Oh, I'm not quite sure I understand this. Is I don't know these terms. So is perfusion MRI useful? Uh, it's not something I use routinely. It, it, it involves um, injecting some contrast medium into the body as well. So there are some risks associated with that. Um, what we know is that by the, by the time perthase is presented to us is that the avascular events already happened and the blood supply has already been reestablished. So for the hip to collapse, there has to be a new blood supply going in to, for the cells to take away the dead bone and put the new soft bone down. So it really doesn't, it's not something that's used routinely in most people's practice, and it is invasive. Very good. I think that's the end of the questions. Um, good question. I, I, yeah, good. Wow, a lot of questions. Yeah. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Nigel, for answering quick fire all at once <laughs> in lots of different directions. Um, um, I'm just going to read a comment. Um, somebody else posted a comment in um, the chat that I want to read because I think this is lovely. Comment from a participant, not a question, but I know from personal experience that there is hope and that my THR has been a great success. My Steps podcast is on the website where I um, where I share my story. So I think it's good to know that, you know, there's I mean, there are so many different ways that perthase can happen, but, you know, there, there's there's good treatment there. And it's great to hear these positive stories. Um, so thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I don't know how I'm supposed to wrap this up. Actually. <laughs> thank you very much for attending. Um, please do. If you have further questions, do let us know. Um, and as I said, you will be getting a questionnaire um, asking for your feedback. So if you could complete that, that would be very helpful for us going forward. Um, and obviously, if you're interested in becoming a volunteer or a fundraiser or getting involved and in working for Steps, just let me know. Thank you again to Nigel for all your help. Um, thanks to Miranda for pulling this together. Ed, Nigel, do you have anything else you would like to say? No, no, just uh, thank you as well. I think it's um, it's nice to, be able to talk about this. It's a difficult subject and there are lots of individual questions I wish, wish we could answer, but they are very individual. Um, but no, you, you've given, given some very good questions, which I think have been fantastic. So thank you everybody for taking part. Thank you for the invitation. Brilliant. Um, yes, excellent. Okay, so excellent webinar, much appreciated. Oh, there's a couple more questions actually. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can see them in. So I think we may have answered this, but Jamie again was asking about perfusion MRI and said, "Would you recommend against this?" But it sounds like you don't use it, but you're you're it's, not. It's you don't say not don't something I've experienced. I've not. I've never never used it. I don't. I haven't found it. I need to use it yet. Okay. Um, and then another question was, are there any medicines being developed related to perthase? Somebody mentioned a study in Australia or New Zealand. So bisphosphonates are the medicines that have been studied. Oh, you were um, talked about in the webinar, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I don't think they're in routine use. Okay, very good. So um, the other thing I should mention is that, as you know, this webinar was being recorded and um, we will, hence why we needed our video editor volunteer, but we will eventually be putting this onto um, our website. So you can watch this again and um, go over the questions if, if you need further help. But do please get in contact with Steps. That's what that's what we're here to do. So if we can help, let us know. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.